there we go. All right, and welcome to those of you joining us now on YouTube as well. As you may or may not know, all of our webinars are recorded and saved on our YouTube channel. So please follow us, subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can see any of the past webinars that you may have missed as well. We want to thank Itasca Bank for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors like Itasca Bank help us to keep these webinars free for everybody. Contact me for more information on sponsoring. You can also help us to keep these webinars free at the end when you close out this screen. Now, I know some people have said this doesn't happen. I know it happens at least for me when I'm on a, a PC on my laptop, maybe not on mobile. I don't know. Um, but that um, whatever your browser window that comes up, that should change over to our website. And that has that page with all of our resources for stuff you might be interested in, like our native plant guide, rain barrel information, and so much more, including our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, please keep the Conservation Foundation in mind for your end of year giving. As I mentioned, we just had our uh, Giving Tuesday, uh, where we got a really nice couple of really nice matches from uh, some donors. But memberships to the Conservation Foundation also make great holiday gifts for those environmentally friendly relatives and friends. All right. So thank you all again for a wonderful year of webinars. I do really appreciate you turning in, tuning in and joining us. So now with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's get started. And here we go. All right. So we are going to be talking today about five ways to be a better neighbor in your watershed. Let me know in the chat. I was just in a webinar today where this, when she started in the um, format, uh, the full screen format that it didn't share. So if you're not seeing that, just let me know in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to assume everybody can see that first slide there. All right. Those of you who aren't familiar with us at the Conservation Foundation, I just like to throw this in there just to let you know who we are and what we do. Next year is going to be really cool. It's going to be our 50th anniversary. And so we've got some really cool things planned for our 50th anniversary, like 50 miles for 50 years. Uh, you'll hear more about that um, through our emails and our Facebook page. Keep a look out for any of that. We're going to do that. We're going to do birthday parties. We're going to do all kinds of really cool stuff. So I'm very excited about our 50th anniversary. Um, but this is our mission statement. We want to improve the health of our communities. And it's not just the health for our birds and our butterflies and our bunnies, but it's also for our human health too, because we need healthy land, healthy water for healthy people. So that's why we do what we do. All right. So let's talk about what a watershed is first. So watersheds, you, no matter where you are in the country, you live in a watershed. You actually live in multiple watersheds, depending on what scale you want to look at. So on a national scale, the entire country, these are the watersheds here. So those of us in Illinois, most of Illinois anyway, are in the upper Mississippi watershed. And we share that with most of Wisconsin, most of Iowa, most of Minnesota. And we are all part of this great big watershed. Now, if we take it down a little bit more just to the state level, and I know this is kind of hard to read, so we're going to zoom in here on Northern Illinois. If we take that down and, and to the next level of rivers, you can see here we've got lots of different watersheds here within the state of Illinois. So um, here in Will County, we are in the Des Plaines River watershed. There's the Fox watershed, the Kankakee, uh, the Rock River, Kishwaukee. There's lots of different watersheds here. And then we can take it down even further if we want to look at, say, for example, the lower DuPage River watershed there on the left. It's lower Des Plaines there on the right. But if we look at the DuPage River watershed, you can see there's also even smaller creeks then that feed into that. So Mink Creek, Rock Run Creek, Hamill Creek, the i &M Canal, all these bodies of water are all their own little like micro watersheds. So we've gone from the big country national level watersheds all the way down to now these individual little micro sorts of watersheds down there. And, and what does it mean? How do we make these divisions? Well, it depends on if a drop of water falls on your property, where's it going to go? Where is it ultimately going to end up? Is, is it going to end up in the Illinois River? 
Is it going to end up in the Des Plaines River? Is it going to end up in the Fox River? All right, that's what determines your watershed is where that drop of water is eventually going to end up. So that's why on the national level, we're in the Mississippi River watershed because ultimately all the water that falls here in Illinois, except for that very part along the edge um, with Indiana there, um, all of it ends up in the Mississippi River. So we've got a drop of water falls on your land. There's a number of places that there's a, a number of different routes, let's say, that it could take before it gets to those rivers. It could be infiltrated, which means soaked up into the ground. And then when it gets soaked up into the ground, it may end up in the groundwater. It could end up racing across a lawn on that overland flow and then ultimately ending up into the river. Um, it could end up in um, little um, like stormwater retention ponds, things like that. So this is the path of a raindrop and this all encompasses the watershed. So all of us are dependent on these watersheds for the water that we drink, whether you have a well and septic system like I do, or if you are in city water, getting water from Lake Michigan, from one of the rivers. Um, I, I have to say it was kind of interesting. I went to all of the meetings. The city of Joliet was running out of water. They were taking it out of the groundwater and the uh, groundwater was starting to dry up. So they had to select a new source for their water. And it was really interesting going to these and, and hearing about all the different options that there were for getting their water from, um, all the different options that were selected and ultimately why some were selected and some weren't because of the amount of flow and things like that. Very, very interesting things. But we are ultimately all dependent on these watersheds for clean water to drink. And that's why it's really important to be a good neighbor. I think this graphic is really interesting too, because it, it really demonstrates the importance of open space. So when rain falls, it's either going to infiltrate, as we mentioned before, it's going to go into the ground. It's going to be runoff or going across the land and right into the rivers and the streams. Or the other one is evapotranspiration, which is a big fancy word, which is effectively kind of like, it's almost like plants sweating. So plants will take in water and then as they quote unquote exhale their oxygen, some water is going to be released along with that. So ev evapotranspiration is just the way that plants get rid of water. Oak trees, by the way, fabulous at this evapotranspiration. If you have oak trees in an area that get a lot of rain, they will help to move that rain. So swamp white oaks, fantastic at helping to suck up that excess water and put it back up into the atmosphere. But so if we look at this graph here, you can see in the top left, natural ground cover. So this means, you know, your average forest preserve. It's going to be all full of trees, open space. We're going to have 50% of that going into the ground. Now the trees are going to hold on to some of that as the raindrops hit the leaves and, and it, you know, it's really going to disperse it so that it's not really hitting the ground en masse and not having anywhere to go. Because the trees help to slowly filter that water down, it's going to give it more of a chance to go into the ground. So in open spaces like that, we're going to have about 50% infiltration. Only about 10% is going to be runoff, and that's because most of that's going to be stopped by the trees and the plants. And then 40% is going to be taken up by the trees and the plants and put back into the atmosphere. Now, if we have a really rural location, so we've got a little bit of impervious surface, that means surface that water can't go through. So think like a concrete driveway, um, stuff like that. So if we've got a low density residential, like a rural area there, we've only got about 10 or 20% impervious surface. We're gonna get 42% infiltration, about 20% runoff. So you see just with that little bit of impervious surface there, now we've doubled the amount of runoff that we get. And then 38% evapotranspiration. If we go down to the bottom right, we talk about the high density residential, industrial, commercial areas. So, you know, downtown Chicago, we've got mostly impervious surface. When rain hits the ground, it has nowhere to go but off. 
we're going to get only about 15% infiltration now and 55% runoff. We basically switched with what we had with the open space there. So that runoff, that water has got to be collected, captured, and pushed off into our rivers and streams to deal with it because we're only getting 30% evapotranspiration now. Trees are doing their best, but it just doesn't have anywhere to go in the ground. So kind of an interesting look at what happens when we create all this impervious surface, how the water just has nowhere to go at that point. So let's talk about how you can be a good neighbor to your watershed. All right, we're not having a, you know, a cookout for the Des Plaines River, but how can we be a good neighbor? Well, first off, let's talk about winter, right? December 1st, winter's coming. It's going to start snowing. Gosh knows, any day now. We got to deal with it. And we got to keep people safe on the roads. We don't want to have crashes. And we got to keep people from slipping on sidewalks and stuff. So we need to be able to do that. And one of the ways that we do that is with road salt. Now, we at the Conservation Foundation, this is sort of a, a pet thing for us because road salt, it's gotta go someplace, right? We use it, it dissolves, it melts the ice, but then what happens to it? Well, when it melts the ice, it turns into water, it ends up in our watershed. And that's a really big problem because chlorides get in our waterways, there's no getting it out. Once it's there, you can't filter it out. There is no way to really filter it out efficiently. So. Once it's there, it's gonna end up here in the Chicagoland area. It's gonna end up in our rivers, into the Mississippi River and heading down to the Gulf. So I find that um, the data interesting from the USGS. In 1940, we used 164,000 tons of road salt. Now, obviously we have massively increased the number of roads that we have since then, but we've gone from 164,000 tons to in the last 80 years, now 24 million tons, even from 1985, right? We more than doubled the amount of road salt that we use on our roads. And that is, that's really not great for our waterways. The um, EPA has limits on the amount of chlorides that can exist in our streams and our rivers. And so we help municipalities to measure that um, and, and so that they can continue to monitor so that they can take action when they need to, um, to, to mitigate that problem. Now, you can also see there one of the ways that they're helping to reduce road salt use. You see those lines down there on the uh, lower left-hand uh, image? That is pre-treatment for ice. And what that is, is it's, it's a mixture of beet juice or something like that, that they spread on the roads before it gets icy. And that helps prevent the ice from sticking to the road so that when the plows come through, the plows have an easier time getting that ice up and we're not so dependent on salt to melt it. We can physically remove it instead of trying to just melt it in place. And that's a really good thing. So one of the campaigns we have going now, the slogan is love the lines. And that's what that's doing. So if you see trucks, plow trucks out before a snow event and you see them spraying something on the roadways, and that's, that's what it is. And like I said, usually it's beet juice or some kind of a mixture like that that's gonna prevent that ice from sticking to the road. So what other problems do chlorides cause? Well, they damage concrete roads, driveways, sidewalks, all of that, you see that pitting, um, you know, in the spring, we always end up with all the potholes around. And, and that's partly why is, is the chlorides do some damage, the freezing and thawing, repeated cycles of that also help to break it apart. So it can be really, really damaging for that. It can also weaken bridges, right? Because it's um, having a chemical reaction with the metal parts of the bridge, but also doing a number on the concrete parts of the bridge as well. So it, bad for roads, bad for bridges, bad for vehicles. Um, you know, I know people who, if they're buying a used car, insist on buying one from the South that's never seen a drop of salt. So it's, you know, just not good. Um, and then as we mentioned, it contaminates the rivers and lakes. And when it does that, the problem is it harms the wildlife and those other cool things that live in our local water bodies. So the fish, 
the mussels, the little aquatic invertebrates, the little bugs that live in there, you know, like baby dragonflies, things like that. And it's just really, it, it's not good for them. And there are many that will not live in, in streams that are contaminated too much with chloride. So that's one of the reasons why we have to monitor that. And then if you look at the shrubs there on the bottom right, you can see that that little brown stripe where that is, that's from salt. That's just damage that came from salting that sidewalk. So we got to keep everybody safe. No, no question about that. We want people to be safe. We want to keep the ice away so that we don't have issues with people slipping and falling, with cars slipping on the roads, but there's a better way to do it. So step one for your own home, shovel first. Clear all the snow from your driveways and sidewalks before it turns to ice. The quicker you can get out there to get that shoveled, the easier it's going to be to get it up and get it off. Now, more salt does not mean more melting. As a matter of fact, if you put too much salt down, that can actually make the problem worse. There's a whole chemistry thing. I won't get into it now. Chemistry was never my strong subject, but there is a whole chemistry behind it that putting down too much salt, putting too much salt in it will make the problem worse. So a 12 ounce coffee mug, just your average mug of coffee should be enough for about 500 square feet of driveway or 10 sidewalk squares. So if you think about that, chances are naturally we just use a whole lot more than that. I can't tell you how many times I've been walking down a sidewalk and you just see a whole strip of the salt laying there. So you want it distributed evenly. So like you can see that spread out pattern there, not in clumps. That'll help you to, lose, to use less by which, by the way, using less means you're going to save money too, but it's also going to be effective in getting rid of all of that additional ice. And afterwards, sweep up the excess. Once your sidewalk is clear and dry, your driveway is clear and dry, sweep up that extra salt. Don't let it just sit there and end up in our sewers. And it's also good to know a little bit of chemistry here too, because rock salt that sodium chloride, that stuff that we normally spread out there, it actually stops working if the temperature is below 15 degrees. So when the temperatures get that low, you know, once we start getting into 10 degrees, uh, I'm not looking forward to that, you know, minus five, whatever, it's just not going to work anymore. So you can throw it out all you want. It's not going to do anything. You need to switch to a de-icer that's formulated for colder temperatures if it's going to be that cold. Something like a calcium chloride, another type of salt, will work in colder temperatures after rock salt stops working. So make sure you know what you've got, what you're using, use the right product. All right, enough salt. We don't want salt going down the drain, but we also don't want other things going down the drain either. Motor oil, cooking oil, or other things down the storm drains, right? When I was a kid, that was the big thing. Everybody was changing their own oil. They would just dump it down the drain. That goes directly, now I should caveat, asterisk this, but many of those storm drains go directly into a river or stream. There are some places, um, I think especially like in the city of Chicago, where it does go through a treatment center, but it doesn't get treated very much, not like um, typical household wastewater. Um, but you can see from this image here, rain falls it goes directly into the storm sewer and that pipe takes it directly into the local river or stream, which means as it's flowing over your yard, it's picking up any chemicals that you've treated your yard with, any fertilizers, um, any dog poop, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Yay, great topic. Um, any uh, oils and things like that on your driveway. It's, it's gonna be picking all of those up as it goes along the way and dumping them right into your local waterways. So that's why it's really important to not put things down that drain that don't belong there. And if you've got a storm drain in your yard, not in your yard, but you know, on the street by your house, like I do, make sure you keep it clear. I have seen it, like I said, I've got one right outside my house. If it gets too full of leaves and debris, 
one storm and boom, my whole street floods. So make sure those storm drains stay clear. You know, periodically we have to go out there and with a shovel and shovel out because we also happen to be at the bottom of a hill. So got to get out there and, and clear away those leaves, clear away any debris that's collecting along those storm drains. And I can't believe we have to say this, but don't flush old medication. A not nearly long enough time ago, I went to my local pharmacy and said, hey, I've got some old medication. What should I do with it? And the pharmacist, the pharmacist said, oh, just go ahead and flush it. Okay. I knew that was not the right answer. And it turns out it definitely is not the right answer. Um, for the most part, with the exception of controlled substances, you know, those kind of things you don't want to put in the trash, but anything else, if you've got like some old Tylenol or something, ex, you know, expired aspirin, put it in the trash. It can just go in the trash. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to do anything special with it. If they are more controlled substances, most police stations anymore, uh, or at least many of them will have uh, take back days where you can go and turn in any of the old, you know, you got some old pain medication from a surgery or whatever, you can go take it there and they will properly dispose of it. Um, here in New Lenox, where I live, our local police station has a box out in front of the station at all times. It looks just kind of like a mailbox and you can put stuff in there. It's locked and secured and they can take it back there. But whatever you do, just don't flush it. I'm, I'm absolutely horrified by this quote that I found from American Rivers about all the stuff that they found in major metropolitan water suppliers. And, and the even worse part was the rest of the ones they, they asked didn't even check. So that number, that 24 water suppliers, that's probably way higher because a lot of them just don't even check for it. So that's, that's kind of terrifying to think of all those things ending up in the rivers and um, you know what our fish have to go through, right? So don't flush medication. Yard waste. I had to put this in here because the number of people who think it's okay to just take some yard waste and go dump it in the creek behind their house, I, it just kind of floors me. I was talking to uh, some folks in Bolingbrook who showed me pictures. They got a call about a backup in a stream, and it turns out somebody had just taken a bunch of logs. They had cut up a a mature tree. And so, I mean, these were huge logs and just dumped them in the creek. And because of, I mean, it caused flooding and it was causing all kinds of problems. Leaves and grass, on the other hand, may not cause backups, but they do cause algae blooms. So when you have excess yard waste, um, like from like grass clippings and leaves and stuff, you know, there's the normal amount and then there's, you know, people just dumping them in there. That's what we want to avoid. So try your best to keep the yard waste out of streams and rivers. And we will talk a little bit more about yard waste in just a minute, what else you can do with it. But you can manage the erosion because erosion is basically taking that shoreline and, you know, droplets of water picking up molecules of soil and washing them into the river. Um, you can help to manage erosion with native plants. And I specify native plants because as you can see in this diagram here, even if you can't see exactly what the plants are, take a look at those root structures. Now, where the lady is standing underneath the tree, you can see, first of all, and this always amazes me, trees have much more shallow roots than you would expect. You know, you really think of root systems as, you know, almost being a uh, mirror image of what's on uh, above ground, but they're really not. They're really very, very shallow. So the grass you can see underneath there, that's right next to that lady that's standing up there. You can see that that grass, that's only two or three inches. Those roots only go down about two or three inches deep, which means A, they're gonna be competing with the tree for nutrients and water and stuff. So that's not good, but it also really doesn't do a whole lot to help protect against erosion. Our native plants, on the other hand, take a look at those root systems, man. You got some, like the buffalo grass is the second one there. Just looks just like regular lawn grass, but look how deep those roots go. It's incredible. And so that very deep, but net-like root system, 
that helps to keep the soil in place and it helps to prevent erosion. So when you have a shoreline that has plants in it, that water then can soak down into the soil. The roots help to punch through that clay, gives the water a place to go, as opposed to our raindrop there that's floating across the surface because the grass doesn't really let it soak in as well. So when you have just regular lawn, that water is going to just fly across the surface of it and empty out into our bodies of water, as opposed to when we've got native plants and other much more deeply rooted things where the water can really soak in. So if you take a look here, we've got the turf grass shoreline versus the native plant shoreline. Huge, huge difference there. That native shoreline is just so gorgeous with all the different grasses and flowers and things in there that's probably gonna be full of butterflies and birds and pollinators. Whereas the one on the left is just kind of, uh, the native plants help to take up the nutrients. You know, I, I guarantee you, at least some of those homeowners nearby probably fertilize their lawns. And as we mentioned, when it rains, th that rain is gonna pick up those fertilizers and things. It's not all going into your plants. As a matter of fact, the majority of it's gonna wash out and end up in a local body of water. So when you've got native plants in the shoreline there, that gives them a chance to kind of soak up some of those nutrients before they end up in the water where they're gonna cause problems with algae blooms and things like that. So having those native plants on your shoreline, not only more attractive, but also better for the water as well. So if you have a shoreline, you can plant it. The next couple of slides are really intended to be for a rain garden, which is also a fantastic way to help keep rain where it falls. Um, but just to give you an idea of some of the plants that you can use, this is for um, the wetter areas of the shoreline. So closer to where the water level is, all these things can handle a little bit of, of flooding. They can handle being underwater briefly, but look how pretty all these flowers are, right? Great shoreline. Now, a little bit further back where they're not gonna be underwater periodically, probably, but if they are, most of them are okay with it. You know, that swamp milkweed, absolutely gorgeous. Marsh blazing star, absolute butterfly magnet, right? We've got all kinds of great things here. Those iris are, uh, iris actually can be either place. They can either, I've seen them effectively sitting in water um, as well as being back a little bit further. Those golden alexanders, fantastic. And then sedges are kind of like grasses and they can just go anywhere basically. All right. And now we also, in talking about yard waste, right? Tis the season. Everybody's getting their yards cleaned up if they haven't yet. Um, we want to leave the leaves. And I know Everybody says, but my homeowners association, I know. Um, we are in the business of changing hearts and minds and we're working on it. Um, best I can say is that photo there on the left, that is the award-winning world-renowned Lurie Garden in Chicago. They, this is what they do for the winter. They cut their stems between about 15 and 18 inches that still gives the pollinators that are overwintering in there a place to be. And it, it's not bare earth, it's not totally cleaned up, but it's, this is what our pollinators need, right? They need some of that standing vegetation in order to overwinter. They also need leaves. So if you can see there, that's the, um, those are insects overwintering in that hollow stem there. And then we have things that mimic dead leaves and this is how they overwinter. So swallowtail butterflies, um, you know, I raised a couple of swallowtail butterflies this summer and some of them turn green, come out the same year, but at the very end there, they turn into these brown dead leaf looking chrysalises that that's how they're gonna overwinter. So they're gonna spend the whole winter in there and come out again in the spring. Check out that Luna moth, right? Luna moths are those huge green moths. They're absolutely gorgeous. They overwinter 
effectively inside of a dead leaf. They sort of wrap a dead leaf around them and, you know, tie it all up. And that's where they stay. If you burn all your leaves at the end of the year, you're getting rid of all of these guys. The first generation for next year is gone. So putting your leaves aside, when you have that standing vegetation, it also acts as a, like a snow fence and will hold those leaves in place. Those leaves make fantastic mulch for your native plants too. It's, it's a perfect storm. It's, it's doing what nature intends. This is how nature does it. We're just relearning her processes. You can also make a leaf mold. It's kind of like a compost, but without adding any food or things in there that are going to you know, potentially attract critters. You just use some tea stakes, a little bit of fencing around it, throw all your leaves in there. You can mulch them first, but again, keep in mind, we, we do still have those critters overwintering. So, you know, maybe don't if you don't have to. Um, keep the pile moist, let it go. And then the next spring or summer, you can take it out of there and spread it in your yard. And you've got a nice compost that works as kind of like a mulch to keep the moisture into the soil and help out those new plants. So something else to do with your leaves other than burning them. All right, I never thought I would have a picture of my dog pooping in a webinar, but here you go. That is my dog, Ace. Um, and if you also have a dog that loves to go for walks, you gotta do your duty. Leaving dog waste is unsanitary, obviously. Mm -hmm you know, the last thing you want is to, you know, have your dog pick up some kind of parasite or something from another dog left behind. Um, one gram of dog poop can contain 23 million bacteria. Blech. And it's different from wildlife poop. I've heard this argument before. People have said, oh, but, you know, coyotes do. They don't pick up after themselves. Well, there's, there's actually a difference. The difference is A, with coyotes and wild animals, it's a closed loop. So they're eating things from the forest and then returning them to the forest. It's a closed loop. Your dog, on the other hand, has a different diet. Therefore, it's bringing in different nutrients, different things, and introducing new things into the environment if you leave it behind. So every time, everywhere, you gotta curb your dog. We, last thing we want is for these bacteria and everything ending up in our water supplies. And if you belong to a homeowners association, a park, someplace that has trails where people walk their dogs, and you would like one of these really cool signs, we can get them to you. They are available for free through our wonderful watershed groups um, that the Conservation Foundation helps to manage. Those are groups of municipalities who get together to help kind of share the cost of all the testing that needs to be done for the EPA, so on and so forth. Um, but they have put together these awesome signs reminding people to pick up after your dog. And so we have some of these, they're really nice metal signs. We have them available. You need to provide your own stake. Um, you gotta be in our service area and able to pick up from our Naperville office, or if you are somewhere in Will County and can work out with me a way to get them. I can help get them to you as well. Um, and then all we need is a photo of your sign in action. So contact me if you would like your very own scoop the poop sign. All right, in your driveway, right? We mentioned earlier um, fixing any leaks in your vehicle ASAP because leaving that stuff on your driveway means eventually it's going to make its way into the storm drains and into our rivers. So make sure any leaks, oils, various fluids, blinker fluid, I don't know, I don't know cars. Anyway, um, any fluids in your car, make sure those get um, fixed up right away. And if you have an asphalt driveway, you want to avoid coal tar sealants on your driveway. Now, I have never had an asphalt driveway, so this was kind of a new thing for me to learn too. Um, fortunately, I have been told that uh, a lot of the big box stores, hardware stores, for the consumer, the, the sealants that you would buy to do it yourself are no longer the coal tar sealants. They are instead the asphalt-based sealants that are basically available right now. So that's good news. 
If you, however, contract this out with somebody else, make sure you ask them what they're gonna use and make sure whatever they're using is not a coal tar based sealant. So they contain those uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which as we mentioned, when it rains, it's gonna wash those out of the material and right into the storm drains. And then it's really bad for fish. So, um, or another option is if you are looking to completely redo your driveway, look at something more permeable. So they now have, in addition to the permeable pavers like bricks um, that you see here, um, I went to Governor State University and their entire, all the parking lots in, on campus there are made from these permeable pavers. Really, really cool. Um, and they really help with the infiltration too. Um, there's also permeable concrete. We have uh, an example of that at the farm. Actually, one of our sidewalks is made from permeable concrete. And it's kind of cool because you can take a bucket of water, throw the bucket of water on, and it just soaks right in. It's, it's pretty cool. It's made with like sponge or something that um, ends up coming out. I don't know. Anyway, it's a really cool product. Um, but other options for driveways that are nicer to our environment. Another way that you can help is to support stream restoration. Number one in our area right now is about dam removals. So the dam at Hamill Woods was just removed. Yay, it was a long time coming. We're very happy to see that because what it does is much like greenways for animals like deer and coyote, removing dams creates open passage up in the aquatic vertebrates. It gives them a place to go instead of being locked up behind this dam. So it makes it easier for them to pass through. It, and, and I know there was some information that's gone out because the, there are other dams that are being removed in the area. There's been a lot of pushback for some reason against them, but a lot of misinformation out there. But at the end of the day, it's highly beneficial for the wildlife to remove those dams. It, it keeps them from being locked up in a small area, gives them a place to go. Um, it's healthier for the river itself as well. Um, Re-meandering streams is another one. Um, you can see there down in the bottom right, that it is a meandering stream. Um, farmers, you know, way, way, way back in the, you know, in the homesteading days would take streams and would channelize them to reduce the area that the stream took up. And, it, you know, there were probably other reasons as well. They also put in dams sometimes to give their, uh, give their livestock a place to water. But by channelizing those streams, that means taking them from going in that big twisty, turny, twisty, turny way into a straight line. And when you do that, the water flows a lot faster and it causes flooding as well. So re-meandering streams, putting them back to the way that they're supposed to go, that sort of back and forth, switchback sort of look is so much more beneficial for the health of the stream, the health of the environment around it. Um, and, and so a lot of places like the Forest Preserve District near me just recently um, re-meandered a stream. And it was really cool because if you looked at the aerial shot before they did it, you could actually see from the aerial shot, just the way the vegetation was around there, you could see where the stream was supposed to be. It was really very interesting. So that's the, the map that they used to put it back. So very, very cool. Um, and then also, we talked about vegetated shoreline. Having a vegetated shoreline, so much more beneficial than riprap. Riprap is the rock that you see there. And, you know, while some people may think it looks nice, I'm going to tell you the first big flood that comes through there is going to wash half of that rock away. So it, it, it's kind of a Band-Aid on the erosion problem. Does not really prevent erosion as much as you want it to. It may slow it down a little bit but it doesn't prevent it anywhere near as much as having a vegetated shoreline. All right, recreating on rivers is really big. And last year with the shutdown and the pandemic, more and more people 
were out on the river. And unfortunately, it was more people getting out on the river who, who didn't really know those sort of unspoken rules. Well, we're going to speak them now because there were a lot of problems that happened and, and a lot of problems with the neighboring homeowners. So um, here are some of the rules to follow when you are recreating on a river. Number one, be respectful. So it's, it's interesting. This is something else I've learned and had to look into recently. And the rules change depending on what state you're in and sometimes even what county you're in. Um, but at least here in Illinois, the landowner owns not just up to the shoreline, but they actually own like the bottom of the river as well. So if you're floating by, you're okay. But as soon as you set foot out of your boat, you're trespassing. So a lot of people apparently don't know that and think that they can just put in or pull out wherever they want. You've gotta be mindful of the landowners um, and, and stay off private property. Float in, float out. Whatever you take with you, take back out with you. Don't throw, obviously, empty bottles, empty cans, empty wrappers in the river. Make sure you've got a secured cooler where you can throw all that stuff so that it's not going to fly out accidentally. And this one I find very, it's funny, but it's not funny. Um, just because it floats doesn't mean it belongs in a river. Pool toys should not be used on a river. They are not as good they are not as high quality, they will probably pop. And now you're going to be stuck somewhere down river with this useless piece of plastic. So just because it floats doesn't mean you should be taking it on the river. I have working, I worked for the Forest Preserve District for a number of years, and it always amazed me at the number of things people tried to take out on the river. And know before you go, check those flow conditions. That's another thing. Um, that I find very interesting. USGS has uh, levels, like they measure the river levels and you can actually go online and find how deep, even just some of Hickory Creek here by my house, you can check and see what the level is there. Um, and so those things are, are monitored, they're automatic data recorders. So they're updated, you know, fairly regularly. So know how fast the river is moving because sometimes it's just not safe to be out there. And let nature be, don't harass the animals, you know, the herons, the beavers, the ducks, even the geese, as much as we want to sometimes harass the geese, um, give wildlife their space. It's better for you and it's better for them. And play it safe. Make sure, you know, you bring your water, you bring a snack maybe. You've got shoes that'll protect you if you got to step out, got a hat, you got sunscreen, all that kind of stuff that your mom tells you to bring. All right. And with that, that's what you need to know to be a good watershed neighbor. I probably went more than five. I got a little, uh, little excited there and, um, you know, was having kind of, kind of having fun with this. So um, hopefully you learned a little bit more about what you can do to be a better watershed neighbor. And with that, I will take some questions. Looks like I've got one here. Um, so Derek wants to know what would be the percentages for a grassland area like a prairie when trees aren't around? So this is going back to that, that graphic about infiltration. Um, actually, they, they're probably gonna be pretty similar to a forested area because the plants are going to, um, the plants are going to behave sort of like the trees do in slowing down the water and helping it infiltrate better. Um, and grasslands also store carbon as well. Um, so, you know, just so it's, it's probably going to be fairly similar. Um, so open space, regardless of whether it's forested or prairie, you know, your, your infiltration is probably going to be about the same there. Uh, Sandra wants to know where is the bridge shown in the left picture that is on the Fox River and I have to admit I am not super familiar with the Fox River so I'm not sure where along the Fox River that is but I I just know that that is the Fox River I hope that I hope that helps um let's see 
first and third slide about design. Sandra, did you mean the slide for um, the rain garden? Is that the one you're talking about? I'm gonna put that one up just to see. Um, let me see if I can go back. Oh, thank you, Gary. I had a feeling you would know. Gary says that's the, the Fox River at, ooh, Tekakwitha Woods. I hope I said that right. Tekakwitha Woods. So thank you, Gary. I knew you would know that one. Um, all right, let's see. I can. All right, we're going to stop sharing. And then I'm going to go back to that design slide. All right, so here is the zone A, that's for your really wet areas there. Lots of different plants. Feel free to take a screenshot if you want. Um, also, as I mentioned, the um, at the end, the webinar resources page that you'll be taken to will have our, um, our plant book on there. there. On our website are also links to how to make a rain garden. So you can check those out as well. So that's the zone A for the really wet parts. This is zone B for the edges. And then the sedges. We've got edges and we've got sedges and sedges have edges. All right. Um, okay, can you briefly explain how a stream is reconstructed to meander? Who? Um, honestly, that is not my specialty. So I don't know the exact methods by which they do it. I mean, step one is obviously outlining where the river should be. And then I'm, I'm, you know, they dig, they reconstruct the bottom um, before they reconnect it up with the river. You know, reconnect, you know, they construct as much as they can. There are ways of diverting it around the edges too, so that you, you know, the river is not flowing where they want to be constructing it. Um, I, I, I have to admit, I was not part of that project, so um, yeah, that that goes a little bit a little bit deeper than my knowledge of, of how that works. But um, yeah, they, they just, they have to recreate the bottom, you know, which they're going to do by, by digging and putting in rock riffles and all of that usual stuff that you would find there. But, um, you know, probably one of the hardest parts is figuring out where it should be. And sometimes aerials, as I mentioned, you can actually see from the aerial where it's supposed to be, but you know, other times you have to go back into the historic records looking for any, any you know, photographs that there might exist of, of where it was beforehand. But yeah, it's, it's really cool. And um, my friend John at NCAP, I'm sure could tell you all about it, but that is unfortunately a little bit deeper than my specialty goes. <laughs> Peggy's response was, yep, find the original, dig, prep, and pray. Yep, that sounds about right. So yeah, that's, like I said, that's I, very limited knowledge on that, but that's, that's what I know. So, all right. Are there any other questions? I think I saw in the chat, there was, uh, let's see. John says, we live on a small three-acre retention pond. The owner used torpedo sand to create a beach. We've been unable to grow any plants. Horsetails have volunteered. Horsetails are cool. I like those very ancient plants. They're one of those uh, kind of prehistoric plants that have persevered. I love them. Um, is rock still problematic to use? Um, so it's not that it's problematic. It's, it, it depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're having trouble getting things to grow, it sounds like your soil needs to be amended. So you could 
add um, you know, clean fill, something like that, add soil into that to help give the plants a place to go. You could, you could try to dig out some of the sand first to take it out. Um, obviously that's gonna be expensive to haul it away and dispose of it if you don't have a place to put it. Um, so, it, you know, that would probably be my number one recommendation. If you can somehow remove the sand, amend it, um, you know, add more soil to it to get it in there, um, that may help you get other plants growing in there. Um, if you can't go that route because of cost or whatever, um, you know, you, you could put rock there. Um, you, you could just leave the sand there and let the sand erode down until you can start getting stuff to grow there too. Um, you know, I'm always hesitant to say, you know, of, of anywhere that nothing will grow, you can usually get something. It's, it's just a question of, um, you know, finding the right plants to go in there. And in a case where you have changed the soil so much, such as adding a ton of sand to it, um, that may take some amending and some, some fixing before you can actually get stuff to really grow in there. So the problem is, is more when people take an existing shoreline that could support, you know, grasses and flowers and things like that, and instead just try and make it turf grass. And then the turf grass doesn't take. And so they just throw down a bunch of rock. So in that case, native plants are a much better way to go. In your case, you've already got some changes there too. So you can either attempt to change it back or, you know, I would almost be afraid if you tried to put bigger rock down on top of the sand that the sand is A, still gonna wash away and that um, it, you know, would be unstable. I don't, yeah, I, I, I don't know, that's a tough one. Good luck with that. Um, send me an email if you, if you wanna talk about that any further. All right, any other questions? I am not seeing any. So with that, I am going to thank you all so much for joining us. I hope to see you back again in January. First Wednesday in January at seven o'clock when we're gonna be talking about designing your garden to bloom as long as possible throughout the season and even still have some winter interest in there as well. So take care, everyone. Happy holidays. Take care. And I hope to see you all again back in January. Take care, everybody. Good night.